I love going to museums, but sometimes you get there and there's an animal. This lion looks like it might have walked out of Africa recently. They've actually been in this museum for a while, like longer than I've been alive. Museums have been educating humans with stories of nature forever, and what better way to tell a story than with the real thing, right? A real lion or a real elephant. But in the 1700s, if you wanted to study animals from history or from another continent, you had to go out and get one, but that wasn't always easy, right? You couldn't just fund an expedition to grab an animal. So commonly you would use sculptures or paintings or drawings or whatever. Not the best. Real is better. So scientists need to figure out how they could save real animals and bring them home with them. They just preserved their skin. Historians borrowed tanning from the fashion industry and from indigenous cultures, and they created tanned hides. Tanning is how we turn furs into hats and water skins and coats and pelts and things. It's thousands of years old, but museums only started using this technology a few hundred years ago. That means that this lion is actually really old. These cubs are from the 1930s. I can't even keep food fresh in my house for more than a week, and somehow that century-old animal, I mean, look at it, it looks amazing. So this question put me on a long journey to find out how do we keep these stuffed animals looking so fresh. Why don't they decay? Hey everybody, welcome back to Uno Dose of Trace. This is the very first segment of Hello Science. I am super, super excited. I really hope you are too. It's finally happening, oh my God, okay. So when you see an animal in an exhibit, at one point it was out in the wild. So to understand this whole journey, first we need an animal. Often they're donated or it's killed by a car or a scientist is collecting it for a specimen. Whatever happened, it's dead now and we wanna freeze it in time. And for that we need a taxidermist. So I went to Brooklyn and I met Divya. I got into taxidermy because I was always fascinated with biology and natural history and art too and I feel like taxidermy combines the best of both worlds so it has all of the curiosity and wonder of the sciences but the joy of creation that art has. Taxidermy, it means moving skin or arranging skin so the only thing real in taxidermy is the skin. Everything else like the eyes, the whole inner structure, all of the anatomy, all of that is rebuilt, all of that is made by the taxidermist. Divya's job is to take raw animals with the bones and the guts and everything in there and just turn that into either a study skin or a mount. I'll explain the differences later. She's the first person that I have ever met who gets roadkill in the mail and is cool with it. <laughs> when I receive a specimen, it's usually whole and frozen. If it's not frozen, I'll freeze it just for for like a week or two. That's really just to kill any like, any bugs that might be on it, any kind of parasites and, you know, little creepy crawly things that could be on it. Freezing doesn't kill everything, but it gets it safe. So that skin, once the taxidermist removes it from the specimen, it's cleaned, all the material that could get decay is removed, so all the fat, all that viscera, all that gooey stuff, all of that is removed from the skin. So the only layer of the skin left is, in leather work they call it the corium layer, but it's like the lowest layer, or like the only layer of the skin that will absorb the tan and that won't decay. And the tan is basically the chemical that you put on the skin to keep it from decaying. Oh my God, I had no idea. I mean, I'm from the Midwest, right? I've been around deer heads and bears that are mounted and whatever in restaurants my whole life. And I had no idea that that was just skin mounted on wood or wire or paper mache or foam. That's like a work of art. And from there, we bring in the science and get to the battle against decay. Tanning has been around for thousands of years. You need lots of water and you need something to scrape the skin with to get the inner layers off. You also need to replace the globular fats in the skin. You can do that with ethyl alcohol or alum or acetone or formalin, which is a diluted formaldehyde or borax, which is a preservative and also an insecticide and antifungal compound. There are lots of different ways to do it. Once the skin is preserved though, Divya can take it and stretch it around the form she built, like you're seeing with this California quail. Basically having a very clean skin and using the proper tanning method or proper preservation method is what keeps it from decaying. I'm gonna ask a silly question. That's I'll okay. Like break it up. <laughs> Aren't these things gross? Like isn't it I mean, kind, yeah. of, isn't it kind of gross? I guess a part of it is a little gross, but I don't know if I like, I guess to me, I kind of think of that part as like, it's just another part of it. It's one step in the process. So thanks to tanning, we've now frozen the animal in time. But at this point, Divya hands it off to somebody at a museum and they have to take over the battle against decay. Once I've prepared the specimen and it's ready and it's handed off, the biggest fear is that they maintain it. 
because taxidermy isn't maintenance free. So to that end, I drove down to the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County to find out what team is taking over next. I am the luckiest person you're going to meet today. You know, I'm a taxidermist working in a museum that's still active, still doing diorama work. We've continued to do diorama work from the 20s all the way through to the present, so we're almost up to 100 years of diorama work with all kinds of different very talented people. Hopefully, you know, 100 years from now, they're going to be there. I love this guy and his love of dioramas, which, by the way, are the name for these things, which I have now just learned do not have to be in a shoebox, although they can be. As soon as I put a skin, right, over a sculpture, it becomes a stuffed animal. But it's not, right? It's a sculpted animal that the skin is then glued to. Hey, I actually knew that one now. And it's Tim's job to take over from Divya to make sure the animals last as long as possible because that does not happen naturally. It takes a lot of work. Even if there's not a taxidermist on staff, there's somebody, often a conservator type person who's trying to make things last. Number one is probably why things last is care. I'm weekly, multiple times, I'm doing a walkthrough and I'm checking. How are we doing? Okay, sometimes I'm carrying binoculars. We've got moth traps out so that if we get moths, which is one of the invertebrate pests, we've got climate control. And we also have sort of an integrated pest management. We're keeping our eyes out for invertebrate pests, vertebrate pests, things that might do damage. They're also in a, often in a protected environment. So they might be in a diorama or they might be in a case or something where they're rarely going to be touched. And if they are going to be touched, Hopefully they're going to be touched by somebody who's knowledgeable about how to touch that animal or clean it. Okay, so Tim doesn't want you to touch his things because of arsenic. Arsenic used to be dusted into these skins or on the feathers to keep insects away because, you know, arsenic. The thing is, that makes them super dangerous for the average person to just go in and touch. Which is why conservators and taxidermists sometimes wear gloves when they do it. Also, why Night at the Museum is not a fun, fanciful childhood tale, but like the prequel to a horror film. There's arsenic on those animals. What are you guys doing, Ben Stiller? A lot of our older mounts here, you know, are treated with arsenic. So, something comes to eat it, it's gonna get, it's gonna get killed. Huh. Um, it's interesting, and sometimes in old bird mounts you see, They've been chewed right down to the skin because they painted the arsenic soap on the inside and the outside. <laughs> it's just the feathers. Oh my God, I love this guy. So they clean, they tan, they keep watch, they use insecticides and they trap, but they also want these things to look good, which is where the art comes back in. Hands and faces, for example, they aren't real. They're made of injectable resins and molds commonly, but because of how skin dries out over time, it doesn't look right. Which is why Tim has all of these animal death masks behind him. Have you noticed that? Holy crap, that's so cool and weird and gross and awesome. So taxidermists clean things, they vacuum things, they soap them up and they wash them off, they degrease them and they paint them, they add makeup and whatever they need to do so specimens don't attract bugs and that way they can fight decay. But cleaning a specimen, like an actual scientific specimen, that's actually bad. Remember a little bit ago when I mentioned mounts versus study skins? Mounts are for the public. That's what you see when you go look at the exhibits. The study skins are for the scientists. They are behind the scenes. The Natural History Museum in Los Angeles, for example, has over 35 million specimens, and when you go there, you only get to see just a few. It's the tip of the iceberg. So if these are all mounts, these are study skins. They almost don't even look real, right? They're protected in a completely different way, too. So here in San Francisco, I went to the California Academy of Sciences to talk to Mo Flannery to learn more. So uh, study skins and mounts differ in a, a couple of different ways. So a study skin is prepared for scientific study primarily, and they are prepared in a way that optimizes storage. So in, uh, a live mount is prepared to display the animal as it would be seen in life, which often means, you know, wings flapping or standing upright. But a study skin is a bird laying on a tray with its uh, wings folded and its legs crossed. And that minimizes the amount of space that that specimen requires for storage. So this is what a typical tray of, in this case, finches from the Galapagos look like. So these also were collected in 1905 and 1906. So back then they would collect a large series of individuals for the museum, prepare them on site um, at the island, 
and then bring them back here. So study skins, they aren't cleaned, they aren't painted, they aren't tanned, they aren't mounted in a way that makes them look alive. They're just stuffed with cotton and left in a drawer to give them a bit of shape. Because these things have been prepared and stored the same way for hundreds of years, you can learn so much from these. You can learn about changes to species, changes to foods and forests, changes to diseases that attacked those species, even changes to the environment. For example, since they're not cleaned, the bird feathers were analyzed in some species, and it was revealed that air pollution got worse and worse and worse from coal until the impact of legislation made the air literally cleaner and you can see it in the bird feathers. And we are just seeing a peak of all of the different specimens available. Every door in this room has dozens of trays and every tray has dozens of specimens. All of these need to be checked and protected and preserved, but they also have lots and lots of data. And often we have no idea how they're gonna be used. So back in 1905 and 1906, when Rollo Beck and his team were collecting these specimens, they had no idea that in 2004, almost 100 years later, a, a scientist, a female scientist, would be cutting into the feet of the birds they were collecting to study DNA of a virus in the foot of the bird. Um, it's my job to make sure that these specimens are still here 100 years from now or 200 years from now or 500 years from now so that researchers can do whatever studies they come up with at that time. Okay, but it's not all sunshine and coal soot, y'all. They're still fighting decay and pests back here too. So we check our specimens regularly and you're looking for basically insect poop. So if an insect is chewing on a bird, maybe from the inside, they would be inside the bird, you would see little droppings, so like a little pile of what looks like dust under the bird. Or if it's a really bad infestation, you would see damage to the specimens. So we have to be very diligent and make sure that um, that doesn't happen. If we do find insects in the specimens, then we will freeze the specimens for a period of time to kill all the insects and hopefully to keep any eggs from hatching. Funny thing though, Mo is not a fan of mounting specimens. Generally, we do not put data specimens on display unless they are in um, climate controlled cases with, rel with strict humidity controls and very low light levels. That's why museums are sometimes so dim. They're protecting the feathers and the furs from fading under the lights. Okay, check out this cormorant that was left in a window. It's so faded. Okay, one more, one more time, Kimball. Yep, that's Kimball. He does collections at the Natural History Museum down in LA. For museum collections, a specimen is not valuable to science unless you know where it was collected and when. Mm -hmm. And then that puts that animal at that place at that period of time in history. One of the problems with mounted specimens that have been on display, traditionally people did not put tags on them. Every one of our specimens has a data tag that's always associated with it. Sometimes two or three or four tags. <sighs> okay, so the list is getting really long here, y'all. We've got decay, we've got light, we've got humidity, we've got pests, we've got climate control, we've got all sorts of different things. We've got even just being handled and being touched contribute to decay. There are so many different little things that need to happen to make sure that these specimens are here for you and for me and for the future. So to answer my own question, lots of different people do lots of different things to make sure these specimens look fresh and clean and are ready to go for whatever we need them for. In this whole battle against decay, it's sort of like, it's a battle against decay, but it's a battle for like keeping these historic pieces alive. And someone can say, oh yeah, that's a hundred year old head. And you're like, wow, that's cool. When you see like the materials, it's so nuts to see. And it becomes so much more real. It's like, these are the stories. Like it really, really tells a story when you see like that. Just thinking about it now, like if you love animals, this could be a career for you. Zoos are one arm of animal preservation and museums are another. It's really everything here still is a custom mount for a particular story we're trying to tell. People, when you say, oh, it's a replica, they're like, oh. But when you see a lot of musculature and stuff, things popping, I can point at those and say, those aren't stuffed animals, right? These people fight off decay so they can tell you a story about a species or a specimen or a whole evolutionary path. 
Whether that story is in the front of the house and it's how lions are socializing, or if it's in the back of the house and it's how environments have changed over hundreds or millions of years, both of those stories take a lot of effort, even if it's just to inspire people to make science videos when they grow up. <clears throat> you know, whatever. Who knows what people are going to study in 500 years. Yeah, and that's what you're trying to do with like all of these specimens. We're just making sure they're here for whatever ideas, whatever research ideas people come up with in the future. That's awesome. Beyond our imagination. Next time you're at a museum and you're looking at all the different species and specimens on display, take a second and think about all the different people that it took to get it there. The person who decided to arrange it in that way. The person who tanned the hide. The person who captured the specimen in the wild. That animal didn't just happen to be there. Some amazing and passionate humans made sure that it was there for you. And now you know. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope it made you feel something. If it did, consider subscribing and joining us here on Uno Dose of Trace. I'll be back with more videos next week, so I'll see you in the future. Uh, that should be a list, which we have to redo because I had some Pelicans, work study students. Pelicans, frigate birds, look like it. So wow, a bunch of seabirds, mostly.